You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405 on this sunny day in Southern California. We have a great conversation coming up today with Charles Antis, the founder and CEO of Antis Roofing. And uh, I've been working with Antis Roofing I've worked with Ansys Roofing several years ago. We've known each other for a long time. And uh, a couple of weeks ago when I saw uh, Charles on uh, on Sinan's extravaganza online, I just knew we had to get him on the show. So welcome, Charles. Thank you, Will. I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. I had a flashback. And it was like maybe 12 years ago or so when we first met. And I remember you floating a concept to me that was counterintuitive to me. And you basically said, if we wanted to be good at sales, we had to disqualify as many sales as we could. And that was something that was counterintuitive to me because I would try to grab everything. And I hadn't yet graduated to that. And this is within the last 12, 15 years. So thank thank you for that. Well, that's right. It's right. When you get rid of everybody who doesn't want to do it, the ones who are still there are the ones you're going to work with. That's great. Well, so so Charles, tell me, what, what are you excited about in the next six months? Well, I think what's most exciting is that I find myself and my company, our brand and our personal brands within our company more relevant than we've ever been. And that excites me because that gives us an opportunity to adapt because I'm not going to say what we want to do. I don't, it's, I'm hesitant to say grow right now because grow is, is not defined necessarily the same way. Like we're growing in market share, but not necessarily in top line sales right now because of some of the shifts in the market. But I want us to be right now in six months looking back and say, wow, remember back then? That's when we really got it. That's when we built in a futurist model of being adaptive, no matter what was going to happen in the environment. And we did it with more comfort. Remember, that's when our culture got really strong. That's when we knew that we were right in bringing purpose into our story, into why we exist. That was a good question, because I think looking back is a good place to look at where we want our stories to be today. You know, it's very interesting. One of my uh, EOS clients, so uh, they, they're using the entrepreneurial operating system, and and we've been working together for about nine months here. And they they import food, so you can imagine what happened in March when all the restaurants shut down. I mean, they had no sales at all. So they began to work together. Now they all were very clear about where they wanted to go, and at that point, it was to grow. And and as they be, uh, began to move home to work, and they did that, and and they they all decided, the leadership team decided, you know, we'll take a twenty percent cut, take one day off a week. Now I, I checked with the owners and I said, well, now what kind of cut did you take? Thinking that you know they were owners and they w- they said, well, we we took a fifty percent cut <laughs> two months ago, and in fact we wanted to. to uh, have no compensation uh, for the duration. And the leadership team said, no, you have to have something. So they worked through that three months. Then they began to get back together. And and the, the question was, do we want to bring that extra day back? And people said, no, we have rediscovered what work-life balance is. And if our productivity is high enough, we'd like to keep that one day off as long as we can because we're finding time to work with our kids. We're t- finding time to do work with uh, 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 social service agencies and nonprofits, and we're having a ball. And it was so impressive that they moved to that place just by discovering that there was more to business than just growing. Well, that's, uh, that's, I think some of us discover that maybe intellectually and some of us trip and fall and splatter and get up and we realize that the stories along the way that happened made us who we were and that we had to bring those real stories of real life, making real impact in the community to work. And I think that that's, that's kind of what happened to us, but I think that that's what happens to every company uh, that, 
you know, the, I look at small companies and small company to me is, you know, 2 million to a hundred million. I don't know. It could be defined. I think your definition is, is uh, 10 to 250 employees. You know, we're right in the middle of that. Yeah. And it's really hard to understand those, those high HR learner learning things. Like if you, if you bring purpose and intent into work, then your people will be comfortable and they'll sleep better. Yeah. And, and I, I think what I need to do will is to qualify myself because I'm talking like I know what I'm talking about, but I haven't given you any proof. So I'm going to tell you just a quick story that tells you how I stumbled into this and how lucky I am that it happened in the first year I opened my doors and that was 31 years ago when I needed every call to survive in this young company. And I, I discovered I had a skill. I could, I could repair what leaked from rain, Mm -hmm. but I just didn't have the capacity to do anything. I didn't have a kettle or crew. So under that duress of needing calls, I get a couple of weeks and the calls are so important. I put weather stripping on the home bedroom converted door to convert it to office so people wouldn't hear my daughter and I got a call from a a woman one day and she had leaks in every room and I was excited to go out there and repair the leaks and as I'm driving out there the next day I notice as I'm getting closer to the neighborhood that the homes are getting smaller and more disheveled and and finally I turned on the street where the home would be and I just saw this like setback home dead grass on the way to it I'm, I'm hoping it's not it as I knock on the door and then three things happen really fast that I'll never forget that change. That's the reason we're talking right here. I wouldn't be here talking if this didn't happen to me. This lady answers the door with this tired look, which shocked me. But before I could say something, I was hit with the smell of mildew. And I was like, oh, and that caused a recoil in me. Like I was turning to go, like, what am I going to say? But as I was turning to go, I felt this tug and I looked down and, and, in contrast to my face and her mom's face, this little six-year-old girl had this big ear-to-ear smile, and she was just so happy she had a visitor at her home, and she pulls me inside into this crowded living room in an undersized hallway, and finally she turns right into her room. I knew it was her room because she pointed to this My Little Pony poster on the wall, but the exact time that she's smiling and looking up, I look down, and I see four moldy mattresses, uh-huh. and I just froze. Because it just, it caught up with me like, oh no, I got to get out of here. I have a mortgage payment. I have, I don't have the money for it. This family has no money. This little girl, as cute as she is, she's a threat to me. And it was that I had the fight or flight going again. And then finally, after like 30 seconds, the mom walks back in the room again with that same look. And I don't know why, you know, the little girl was a threat, but the mom walks in with that look and, and then I just, something came out of me that I don't ever remember hear my, I never heard myself say before uh, until that moment. I said, I'm going to take care of your roof. And, and I didn't know if I could. And I think that's an important pause right there is like, that was painful. I remember, Will, I seriously did not have money to make a payment on a house that was like a $2,000 payment. And yet I told this mom, I was going to take care of a roof, you know, I mean, I don't know where that comes from, but if I, if I, I'm, I'm glad I can pause on that because in doing so, I remember climbing up on the roof afterwards, like, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, please don't be anything. There'd just be a hole in the roof. And no, it was, the roof was gone. They needed a hole in the roof and I didn't have any employees. So I, I caught on the phone and I got all these volunteers. Right. But, but in doing that and then showing up and installing that roof, and then every time I bumped into one of those volunteers, every time I bumped into one of the siblings that lived, which I did for a while, there was a really strong bond or something. I didn't know what it was. I didn't push toward it, but it kept reoccurring whenever we donated a roof. And then eventually we started having employees and the employees knew we were donating this roof. There was a feeling that eventually is what today we call culture. But when you start a young company, you don't know what the hell culture is. It's a thing. It's like, what is that? You know, culture, though, today is that bond, that alignment in why we exist. And at Antis, it's very defined. We exist to keep families safe and dry. And it makes every call easier to answer. And we say things like this, every nail matters that's a great line. There's 200,000 parts in the average HOA roof we install. And it does matter. Every nail. And it also has a component to the people that, who install those roofs. Every nail matters. So it, it took this, this journey started with that first roof where we had 
I call my doctor on an airplane moment. I had a skill that I could give that I maybe didn't want to do, but I, I found a way to say maybe, and that changed everything. And that's what I've made it a habit of since then. It did took a while before I realized there was a formula to it, but there is a formula to doing good in business. It's kind of like that stuff that dad told you, do the right thing, yeah. but do it. And there's a way to do it with the new generation where that does their selfies. And at first, you know, do the right thing. You don't talk about it. I come from a generation where you don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. It feels immoral to talk about it. The first time Habitat wrote in a news, they said, Antis Roofing, donating roofs, transforming lives. I mean, it felt blasphemous for, to make that claim. And now I understand we have to make that claim. That old way of thinking has gone. We have to take the selfie and show. If we don't take the selfie and show it, then how is this movement going to grow? Well, and let me so ask, we live let in me a really powerful time. Let Sorry, me ask you some away. questions. Yeah, that's fine. But I want to ask you some questions. You said, I didn't know where it was coming from. Remember that? I was there. I said, I am going to fix your roof. I had a $2,000 mortgage payment, and I didn't know where it was coming from. Where did it come from? Well, there's, there's something that I don't like to define, but I like to recognize through story that happens over and over and over again. I, I don't like to define it because I like to leave the bridges all the way to open to everybody because I think the same thing happens to everybody. But I say it like this. I used to say no when somebody asked me for something that I couldn't do because I wanted to teach them a lesson in the moment. We can't do that. And I would cut down any possible creative idea. But then I just learned this little habit that started back then with that roof, but since then it's more defined. And that is, I say, maybe. I've learned to say maybe instead of no. And so we get asked for roofs and stuff, donations that we can't afford to this day. And it feels just like it did that day. It feels like you're ripping a rib out of me is the only way I can describe it. Like, <gasps> like I cannot do that. But we don't say no. We don't say can't. We say maybe, no matter what I feel. And we go to bed with a maybe. And all I'm saying is I'm not saying why, because I truly am really comfortable in not knowing why. And, and I, I like to have a really open spirituality. But I go to bed with a maybe, with an open-mindedness toward all things and all people. Watch how those maybes turn into yeses. Yes, and it happens because, in my life over and over again. Because... We are taught that the world is based on scarcity. There's not I would agree with enough. That. Yeah. There's not enough. And what I believe you learned in that, and maybe you didn't learn it right then, but that was the first opportunity to learn it, is that the world isn't built on scarcity. It's built on abundance. Well, that's one way to say exactly how I feel. Yeah. I mean, you, I can say it in a lot of different ways. I yeah. can say it like, I think, Will, you and me and everybody listening in the, to this podcast, I think every one of us are creators. Yes. All we are are creators. And I can't define that very well, but if you think of it that way and be open-minded and make sure that you realize that everyone and everything is the same thing and we're all one, there's something powerful there. But I don't like to define it much more than that. No, and, but it, and it, it's, it's uh, a difference. It it's what, <laughs> what, is it that, what is it that we are, you know, what is it that we're afraid of? Uh, and I just don't believe in fear because fear comes from there's not enough. There's not enough life, not enough time, not enough money, not enough friends, not, not enough. And so this fear causes us to push back and create separations and defi definitions. But once we can recognize there is enough, then that openness that you talked about, that maybe, right? The maybe always leads to a yes, I mean, it can't not lead to a yes, because we, we've we moved from the place where the no is, I, I don't have enough, I can't afford it, I don't know how, to maybe opens up the creativity that we all have access to, because if it's if it's not you or me who's going to do it, there's somebody out there who can. Well, we all have this thing, though, we don't see ourselves we all put ourselves in these, uh, our parents do it to us. We do it to our kids. We don't mean to, but we put them in boxes. We make them like us. We don't see ourselves often as high as we can. And just like that little kid, you'll notice not this year, but most years trick-or-treating that doesn't quite know, isn't quite feeling worthy of being acknowledged. I think that all of us have a measure of that. And one of my most important tasks in life is not 
you know, if I want to put on the best roofs, then I better be a people awakener. I better help people see how freaking awesome they are because, and I wake up sometimes, Will, with this old tape playing in my head that something's wrong with me. And I don't like to say that because I, I, I like to think that I don't, I won't always do that, but sometimes I do. That's why I have a morning practice uh-huh. of whatever it takes, you know, journaling, whatever it takes to make sure that I have a chance to see that this is a magic day of creativity where all I'm supposed to do is go out and lift everybody I touch and awaken people to their awesomeness and nothing else matters. And, and if I do that, then I have impact everywhere I go, you know, and it's so weird to be a guy that sits on a dozen boards well, even a college board who didn't graduate college, but has impact everywhere. It's because of what you're saying. It's the way, it's the way I see myself because I was fortunate enough to have people around me. And I do today that remind me that I'm way more awesome than I wake up with that tape. Yeah. Playing. And I think yeah. we hang around people. If we hang around people that see us, that hold us that way. And that's why I'm, I serve on so many boards. You become who you hang around with. And I sit next shoulder to shoulder with the best leaders and the kindest, biggest, hardest people, the most generous people I know. And somehow by some miracle, I now have a lot to give and I give a lot and I'm more comfortable because of it. Uh, And I want to challenge that. You didn't just become something that you could give. You always had it just like everybody else. You became aware that you could put that to work. You could use that, make that available to others. And that happens at every level. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it happens, it happens in, in Riverside, where Inland Harvest is one part of the whole logistics around the country. They get, 18, they get 80 tons of food boxed in 22-pound boxes every Thursday. And then 70 different institutions in Riverside, one of which is St. Michael's Church, which where my, my wife is in charge of that, that, mm. uh, that mission. And they, uh, you know, St. Michael's goes over with a pickup truck, a borrowed pickup truck, and picks up a ton, a hundred of those 22-pound boxes, brings them back, and then a hundred cars just line up. People put them in the trunk, and off they go. Every week, a hundred, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, every week, a ton of food goes out through that. And what is that? That's 10 people supplying that. And everybody has that opportunity. Everybody has that possibility, the one you're talking about. We can choose to do that when we want to. Well, it's not easy to, well, I got to tell you a story about that. You know, when we were in our philanthropy, we were donating the roofs for Habitat. We've donated every roof for Habitat for the last 80 families in the last 11 years, all the last 80 families. We've donated the roofs. But we also do Meals of Love at Ronald McDonald House. But when this thing, and this is where you heard me telling something to this on that Impact 2020 conference, is, you know, when this when this pandemic shifted everything, a lot of th- we didn't know. And first of all, everybody was scared. Our employees we're pretty secure employees, but they became really insecure employees. And then some of the things that made us feel better weren't happening like the builds and the meals of love. And then, and I, and I was concerned about how I lead, how do I raise my voice? And I was being steady in the moment. I knew that was my job. I was, I was very visual in that. However, my philanthropy was halted. My stories were halted. And, and that's when I heard what you're talking about, food insecurity. Food insecurity to me was always something that happened in third world countries. Right. Even though what was happening here, I couldn't hear it with the seniors and with the kids. But when the pandemic shifted everything, man, it got to 22% in Orange County. I'm sure it's higher in San Bernardino, but similar numbers across the country. And, and I couldn't hear it, but because I had nothing else to do, I put my foot in my mouth, or I put my, I got my, I said, how can I help to Second Harvest Food Bank, mm-hmm. uh, Bank Harold Herman? And he said, drive in the Second Harvest Truck Brigade. And so I showed up and that's what happened to me. This is my day that I shifted. I, I'm driving food and I don't want to do it, but I'm carrying it up because I'd been kind of in my home sheltered for a couple of weeks. All of a sudden I'm picking up this box of food. I'm carrying up the second store of this condo. And I hear this woman's voice, please bring it inside. And she's a really elderly woman probably 80 and she's in a nightgown and she says please put it down and then she just starts doing this thing and she started coming toward me and she started saying bless you bless you and at first it was just i just didn't know i was kind of deflecting her little bless you bombs like and all of a sudden i turned 
And I just felt something that was really powerful. I felt like, oh, wow, what's that? I felt like I was connected for the first time. I, I was kind of in a fog and I was wondering how to lead. And all of a sudden in the moment I knew, well, this is what I have to do to lead. Yes. I need to be here in the community, understanding through the lens, through the pains of our community. And that woman, before I left, she said, excuse me. And I, I thought she was going to come back with a gift. And I was excited for this gift. But she came back with this completely flat tube of Coldgate toothpaste asking, you know, if she could get some more. And I, I think I had the, the beauty and the soberness in the moment. And I think it, 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 I came back a better leader. And as a result of that, our trucks, our, we sent a fleet of trucks every Wednesday at two, because that was the spot they had the hardest time filling, yeah. uh, driving in the Harvard Truck Brigade so we could bring food to the elderly. And then we participated with with uh, Orange County Food Bank, bringing the food through the farms like you're talking about, the churches and through the mm -hmm. schools and through the families. Uh, and it's uh, when you start to do that, then all of a sudden, right now, we have a liveness again. Because we're doing that. We're doing blood drives. Next week's our 19th blood drive here in the last six months. Yeah. We've raised, so I think, 1,400 life-saving treatments of blood. And then we're bringing, we're, we're partnering with Wing the Lamb and Wahoo's Fish Ta Tacos, bringing uh, support and care devices and, and, and warm burritos to frontline health heroes and police fire at hospitals. And so right now, man, I was wondering eight months ago, am I on the right track? I mean, I knew I was, but when the thing shifted, I thought, Oh shoot, am I on the right track? And now more than ever, I say, yes, I say, yes. Oh, but, that, but that means you're distract, totally distracted from your business, Charles. Yes. <laughs> let me tell you why that matters. Yes. Let me tell you why. I, those of you, you could, I mean, you can tell I'm a pretty good salesman and, and you know, we, we work together, you know, and I, I love sales, but is the best thing I could do to help my company go sell jobs. And I can run a really clean, great job. Is that the best thing I can do? But, but figure this, if I go spend most of my time working in the community, building relationships, and then not questioning everything everybody's doing right directly like I used to when I founded my company because right. now I'm attracting top talent because of the things we're doing in the community is relative, right? Not just to the community, but to the employees we attract and retain top talent in the roofing industry. The national attrition rate is 54% leaving a single company. The average, yeah. you know, the last two years we tracked pre COVID, we were at 91, 93%. Right. There's right. a tremendous difference in what that does to your culture, what that does to your quality, what that does to your morale. And then that also has the same effect in the community because the consumer, when they're aligned with you, with your story and it rings with authenticity, then nothing else, nothing else matters like that, including price. That's right. So it's an That's right. incredible Absolutely. shift. And, 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 and it's, it's the, you talk about culture. We talk about core values. Those core values, that, that's the reason we come to work is because of those core values. And, and as those get rolled out and everybody in the company begins to make a choice, it's either, yes, I like these values or no, I don't, in which case I'm going to find another place. When 100%, 100%, uh, every single person in the organization lives out those core values, that culture is enormous and it has an enormous impact on not only the company but the rest of the community and then when you act those out and live them out that's that's the way to build a company and now what what do you see as in the in the next six to nine twelve months what do you see as the issues that we as as a uh, you know as orange county what do we need to be paying attention to well i mean i i i I really believe in a, in a social do good voice. And that just means making sure that in all conversations, everyone's included, but let's, I want to back away from that because I'm also a realist and I know businesses have to be profitable. Um, I think I, I alluded to it earlier. Uh, we're, we're right now trying to build strategy sessions in a new way. Our, our uh, years ago, we would plan like a three year strategy and, and right now we're moving into a super adaptable world that where the new normal three months from now will almost certainly be eclipsed by another new normal at least six months later and the same thing. And so one of the things that I'm really pushing 
and we're having a, a comfortable um, conversation with our management team on what's most important. But I think we all agree that the most important thing is to build this futurist mindset, this adaptable adaptability. And there's better language to this. I'm just learning to speak to this. But our brains are not meant to think as adaptable as we're going to need to be in the market we're moving into no matter where your business is. And so the discipline that I'm trying to teach in all of my boards I serve on and in my company is this language of being super adaptable in a super adaptable world. And philanthropy plays a big part in that because think of it this way. I've been saying this for a long time and it rings so true now. Right now when things are so volatile, my company, my people have more security than they ever have because of our culture, because we exist for a reason. And our reason we exist shows up in the community and it makes us feel safe and it makes our partners feel safe. I kind of got lost on where I was going with that. What was the question again? Well, well, you know, what do we need to be preparing for? What do we need to be doing as a, and, and not just as business, but as, you know, Orange County, what do we need to be doing? Where are the areas that we need to be working on in the next six to nine, 12 months? Well, I'm working in a lot of different capacities there. I'm also part of the CEO Alliance, where the CEO Alliance is CEOs of the most prominent organizations in our in our county, and they're they're really into issues that 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 are going to make us whole in the future. Last year and the year before, they were focused on food insecurity for children in the biggest way. The focus the last 18 months, though, is more on survival and thriving as an economy. And they were spot on before COVID. And right now, it shows the brilliance. And it's really building attention on Orange County and driving uh, innovation, driving uh, attraction of top talent here for the tech industry and all industries. And so I'm involved in a lot of conversations. I'm also involved on, on, I'm on the executive team on, I'm on the United Way board, but I'm also on the executive committee for the United to End Homelessness. And I think the homelessness initiative, I have a lot to say about that. And, and I think it's worth a quick story. And that's the story of Paul Leone, who's the founder of the Illumination Foundation. And I think sometimes we forget about the homeless population because they're, they're within the margins. And for some reason, our brains let us discard them, most of us. And I did the same thing, you know, until, until one day at a stoplight, I looked over and I saw a homeless woman. And I did nothing. I just remember seeing her until I saw a bicyclist drive up to her. And I watched her flinch when she saw this male bicyclist. I still did nothing. The bicyclist reached into his backpack and he pulled out his lunch's two liter bottle of water and he slowly handed it to her. And she nodded her head and he drove off, never noticing my stare. And that was when I suddenly, about three years ago, as I was going to receive an award, I paused and I showed up in tears because of what I saw that day. But the the guy who describes it better is Paul Leone, who is the advocate for the chronically homeless. And he describes this veteran named Stephen that he found near death under a freeway. And he was so bad and he had an infected arm, they had to amputate his arm. And two weeks later, when Stephen woke out of this coma, he looked up and the first words he said to Paul was, Paul, I want you to know, in the 10 years that I lived under that freeway, I can count on my one hand how many times I was acknowledged by another human being. That makes me remember this. And so I got to tell you, it's hard for me to sell homelessness. I can sell Habitat for Humanity because we all believe everyone has a decent place to live. But for some reason, it's hard for me to talk about homelessness. But you know why I do it? Because my dad would have said, and he said he's, he's still alive, he'd say today, because it's the right thing to do. You know, I, I exist to keep families safe and dry. And who, who am I to overlook? Those are the most vulnerable. Those are the least safe. Those are the least dry. And so I think for me, it, uh, I have a lot of issues that I am. And also I'm an advocate for children, sick children. I'm on the board of Ronald McDonald House. I'm also the campaign chair uh, for, for doubling the size of the house. We've raised 9.3 of the 12 million. We're raising it in the pandemic because we need to double the size of the house so we can keep families close to their sick kids and that's why i'm wearing these socks right now i wear them every day i've been wearing them for years in fact i got a hundred other people around the county or across the country wearing them advocating 
for Ronald McDonald House so we can keep families close today when they need it the most. And so I can keep going because I have a lot of issues that are really important to me, but really my message is, is to the community as a whole. I don't, I don't get political. Uh, thank goodness I don't have to play in that game. Yeah. I get to talk about building bridges, never destroying them. And I want to look back at 2020 as the time, whether I'm looking back as six months from now, a year from now, or five years from now, is, oh my God, do you remember when we woke up and we saw how to build bridges and that we saw those things we couldn't see before and that beautiful growth started emerging out of the rubble? I want to, I want to, I want to be part of that story. That, then that to me is what I agree with you that our task is for the next six, nine, 12, or more months is building bridges, coming together on things that we absolutely agree on and, and moving forward with those. There's so much out there that gets a lot of traction from separating us and, and making us different or, or seeing somebody else fearfully. And our task, I believe, is to do exactly what you're talking about, is coming up with those things that are human to us and helping us to respond in the same way that you responded to that first woman with mildewed mattresses. I got to do something with this. I can do something with this. There is enough out there for me to thrive and still do this. I want to tell you, if you want to hear a good story that makes your point, um, we have totally been doing these blood drives here. And I have these beautiful stories, these blood drives like this, uh, this one guy, I think his name, Nigel, he comes in and he said, you know, I was, I, why do you give blood, Nigel? He says, well, I was struck with this condition and I hate it. I have too much iron. I've had to give blood every week of my life. And it was a curse until the one day I met this little girl who needed a blood transfusion every week just to live. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's like he's hearing him say that. I was like, wow. You know, but, but the one that really, the metaphor story that I was mentioning was a man named Harry, who I know through the roofing industry nationally, and he was in our area, and he heard we were doing a blood drive, and he came in, and he came in, and I was joking with him. I said, Harry, if you're going to give blood, give blood with both arms. And that night, Henry sent me an email, and in the email, he said, Charles, you shocked me when you said that, because I grew up in a war-torn Lebanon, Mm -hmm. civil war. He said that it was so bad. The fighting was so bad that people were dying in the hospital with lack of blood because no one would brave the war. Until the largest man in the village heard this and he, he braved the war and he stormed the hospital doors and he said, take what you need from both arms and don't <laughs> stop until you have enough for all. <laughs> and, and that story was it, cre- it, it crept across the land and when people heard it it changed the tone of the war and and i thought when harry told me that story it was emotional for me because it, even more so like when i delivered that box of food to the elderly woman and she blessed me and blessed me like i woke but it woke me further because i thought wow how am i saying this or am i in with both arms and so that's my challenge to people when i tell that story is where is it that you can be all in with both arms and look back on 2020 and know that that's when you did just that. Mm-hmm. So it's a, that, I love that story that Harry yeah, tells yeah. that Harry told. I'm so glad he told it to me. Yeah. Well, that's, that's wonderful. And, and I think sharing those stories with each other is important along the way to helping us remember we have more than what we need to solve every one of the problems that we have right now. We literally have more than what we need. That's no, what, I agree. That's what I discovered with, uh, with Inland Harvest Food Drive. Uh, uh, here's, here's the food coming from the farmers. The FDA, pay, uh, yeah, FDA paid for it. And, and here it comes in with beautiful boxes filled with this. And, and volunteers are, are the logistics arm and give it out. And, and where's that coming from? Well, a friend of mine gave me this wonderful book called The Deficit Myth. And it helped me to see that, that as, a, as long as the inflation is down, the federal government can print as much money as it wants to. As much yeah, I'm, as, not an expert. I'm not an expert on any of that. <laughs> well, but, but it's an interesting concept that, that as long as the inflation level is down, we have plenty of resources. And, and just, I mean, just the, the idea of that freed me up. 
that it, it doesn't have to come from the federal government. We have as much as we we have more than what we need to solve the problems. And and you know when we get to that place, and then sit down and take the the the, the skill that entrepreneurs have in Orange County. And, and set it solving the problems that are there. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's not any, to me, to my way of thinking, it's not any different from having those three mildewed mattresses and a $2,000 mortgage and standing there saying, I don't know how, but I'm going to do this. Well, we're also fortunate to live in Orange County. Being involved in, a, in organizations across the country, we, I, you just don't realize how lucky we are, the way things echo around here. Like we, we share, we, when it comes to social giving, we really do insulate and put our arms around each other. Uh, and, and, um, and it shows up in places too, because if I'm on a national committee or board and I'm used to that, then I can say things slightly ahead socially of the messaging of other counties across the country. And what that gives me is a competitive advantage. That's not why I do it. It's just something I'm just telling you I discovered along the way that when you're from Orange County, and I know this is true of other people and you're on national committees and boards, you resonate well because you're from this cool place that has cool language that has to be socially forward. And, and whether you got here kicking or scratching or wantingly, you are socially forward if you're thriving in business in California. Mm-hmm. Therefore, get involved in national boards and help them be socially forward because we lean a little more that way. And, and there, is a, there always is, through all the turbulence, a socially forward messaging. And, and, and socially forward is, is not necessarily, it's one way to say it. I, what we're returning to, businesses are returning to a community partnership. And if you study the businesses of 100 years ago and more, my grandpa was a, you know, he came west on the Dust Bowl, Grapes of Wrath style, looking for work, picking beets in Idaho. And he landed a job in Northern California for the McLeod Lumber Company falling timber. And that's where he worked. And they didn't just build him a house. They built him the doctor's office. They provided doctors. They built a baseball field where he learned to be a great baseball player, got a trial with the St. Louis Cardinals because the company he worked for was a social steward. I don't know why they did it, but they did it. I think we're returning to a time where we do it. And like, you know, dad said it was the right thing to do. Well, right now it serves me to do so. I not only do we donate, we've averaged donating Three and a half percent of our top line sales. If that's if we're twenty million, that's seven hundred and fifty. It was you know, like almost a million dollars we end up donating, and yet we end up better off. And I don't know why it works that way, but it's just the way it does. It's called abundance. We're, we're, it's called abundance. It's yeah. Well, I like I like abundance. to play ignorant. I yeah. like to play ignorant. And the yeah. reason I like to play ignorant is I don't want to discount anybody else's theory. No, it's it's a matter of the more we give, the more we get. And that has been true over and over again. I, I don't disagree. I, I actually agree with that. I just like to, I like to poke at it and call it in different directions. I like to get other people to say it different ways, just because I want everyone to have a more exclu- inclusive language. Sometimes we don't realize it, but in some of the nonprofits that I'm on, we sometimes get our language so tight that other people can't discover it. And we want to create language that's inclusive to everybody. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Charles, this has been wonderful. And like I said, we're going to get together for lunch soon. Uh, Socially distanced, of course, but we'll get together for lunch. That sounds like fun. This was a great conversation, Will. Looking forward to seeing it. what, What would you like to leave us with? I will say this. If there's any Orange County businesses listening and you're a CEO or you are number two, you have to be number one or number two for this message so you can cut this, send this to the socially forward or the company that, you know, wants to have a brand like ours, because we're having this inaugural class starting that I just announced this morning in the United Way board meeting. It's been a brainchild of mine for like almost 10 years. Finally, United Way's brought it together and we're creating a class just for CEOs to teach the imperative of the imperative of social responsibility. It's not if it's like, you better get this or you won't be in business. And the first 12, we're going to go make an announcement live. Uh, I think today it goes out and, and we made it to the board this morning and I'm going to start pitching to individual companies. And once this fills up this cohort, we'll, we'll have continuing classes, but this is a class that I've built in design to be emulated nationally 
because I love to create stories that have huge impact. And this is something that, that the United Way, Libby, uh, Chris Tickner, uh, B. Bacalandro, if you want to learn what we do and go into a deep study, it's going to be like every Thursday, or every other Thursday, like three hours for three months. And then you'll be able to graduate with this class. You're going to have a great understanding of what it's like to run a business and be socially forward and then reap the benefits of being socially forward. So that's my last pitch. We're going into a new world. It is time to learn to be adaptive. If you want to be adaptive, then build it on culture. If you want culture, then do good in the world. All right. Thank you so much, Charles. All right. Thank you, Will. There you have it. A wonderful, wonderful conversation about what it is to thrive in your business in California. Thanks, Will. You've been listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. To hear more of the programs in this podcast, go to www.willchrist.com.